Thank you, Andrew. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as been introduced, I'm Coral Burst and I'm with Cape Nature and I'm going to represent um, the end result of a task team's work. Um, I'm acknowledging some of my co-authors in the final document, but it's been a collaborative effort over a number of years. Um, we all know that South Africa has a large diverse mammal fauna and it forms the cornerstone of the, the wildlife economy. However, surprisingly, if anyone's looked at any of the reference books, we don't really have good maps of distribution ranges for the majority of the game species. And it makes it difficult for us to, to make decisions or to do conservation assessments um, for those species. And I'm going to go through um, some of the history, some of the methods we used, um, some of the implications, and hopefully you'll all have some food for thought for later um, in terms of what is busy happening um, in the wildlife economy industry. So briefly, the background in terms of from a policy perspective, um, there's been a lot of work done over a number of years. They sort of follow a uh, course. Um, I've just summarized it generally. In the 1990s in the Cape Province, um, we had the original mammal translocation pro policy for the Cape Province. Um, but it also identified, um, let me find this thing. Um, this is a, these are all roan maps over the period. So in that case, it identified, it's difficult to see the shading that that is roan. And even though it was for the Cape Province, it covered all the species because we were looking at what was alien to the province. Um, then in 2007, the process sort of culminated in maps that had a dark area and a light green area, and the light green area was considered to be benign in terms of the introductions, um, and that being the natural distribution range. In 2012, the task team appointed by DEA or mandated by DEA looked at um, the history of where we got and actually started really interrogating, you know, what do we, what do we want to define? Um, and we came up with the initial maps that looked like this um, and realized that there were still some gaps in those. Um, and if I then go on, um, from an academic perspective, a lot of work has also been done in terms of trying to fill the gaps in distribution. So it's around distribution data. Um, 1969, I think it was the work by Duplessis. This is also Rhone maps, so just so that it's a little bit consistent and people can see where the differences are. Um, that being marked as the historical distribution range and at that time, the current distribution range for Rhone. And which of those do you then use, you know, when you're looking at what is the natural distribution range? Do you use, you know, the current range and then the industry happened in the late 70s, early 80s, um, resulting in these human-mediated translocations? So do you then consider somewhere where it's introduced as part of the natural range or naturalized range? What is the purpose? And I think um, the, the past of trying to come up with this is, is wrought with the, the different objectives of, I'm going to say, um, wildlife management, because us in protected area management, we've also um, strived or, and had strife around how, um, how do we reconcile what we want to achieve. Um, and then there is the conservation aspect um, that I will get to in a little bit. Um, so as a task team, we started to define the purpose for defining these ranges and primarily looking at it from a conservation uh, perspective is that it's to enable conservation assessments. If we knew where we were supposed to have something, we would know what we have lost and how we would set targets. Um, if we're looking at managing meta populations, where populations are fragmented or have become fragmented, how would we go about establishing uh, connectivity in terms of dispersal? Um, obviously to enable the effective implementation of legislation um, in terms of TOPS, the Biodiversity Act, um, and then also in terms of the Protected Areas Act um, and its objectives, and also some of the other objectives around the Biodiversity Act. Also to inform restoration and species recovery plans. Um, and then to address uh, the absence and inaccuracy of the references for the natural distribution ranges of species. Um, and as I've said, it's quite challenging due to uh, the human mediated dispersal, but we had to go and dig in the archives um, and then try to set a baseline. So if we're concerned about what the effects are of climate change is that we have some sort of a baseline to look at how things move. And despite all the, you know, the importance of all the things we've listed, we actually haven't yet concluded this set. They are now in the final phase where they will be gazetted for public participation. Um, and hopefully we can move forward from there. So if I try to relate this to the biodiversity economy, um, 
I haven't participated in the Biodiversity Economy Labs, but I read the document, and what jumps at me is that the priority for the Biodiversity Economy is um, to look at conservation and protection of the country's ecological infrastructure, and how that relates to mammal distribution maps for me is that they're a component of the ecological infrastructure. It's something that we need to understand, and if the priority is to conserve those, then we should be looking at um, how do we fit those in and how do we classify them as part of the ecological infrastructure? And then the vision of the biodiversity economy strategy um, is basically focused on optimizing economic benefits from sustainable use. Now, sustainable use has various interpretations, but we know what the white paper says. So it has to be conservation and then a sustainable use, and that's our interpretation. So um, coming up with these maps, we're hoping that we can facilitate um, how we would look at what is, what is sustainable use of biodiversity, um, as opposed to, I'm just going to briefly say, agricultural assets. Um, <clears throat> and then in a biodiversity um, conservation paradigm, where we looked at is where can we, where can we get assistance in terms of helping us come up with um, what these maps should be and what they are. So the IUCN provides us with a definition, and they talk about what an indigenous range is, and it says, um, of a species is the known or inferred distribution generated from historical, written and verbal accounts, or physical evidence of the species occurrence, where direct evidence is inadequate to confirm previous occupancy, the existence of suitable habitat within the ecologically appropriate proximity to proven range may be taken as adequate evidence of previous occupation. So this formed the basis for how we tried to come up with a, new, a natural distribution range. So natural distribution range for us, synonymous with um, indigenous range in terms of the IUCN. Um, and if we then look at the conservation assessment criteria that specifically speaks to how do you assess whether something is contributing from a conservation perspective, there are four um, sets of criteria in the new I IUCN, the 2016 Red Listing Guidelines, that say that if something is outside its natural distribution range, for it to be considered to contribute to the conservation of the species that is being assessed, um, the intent of the introduction should have been to reduce the risk of extinction. The introduced population should be geographically close to the taxon's natural distribution range. Um, the guideline mentions that within the same uh, bioregion is generally appropriate, and those bioregions are published by the IUCN as the terrestrial um, ecoregions of the world, I think is what they are termed. Um, and then it says the introduced population has to produce viable offspring, um, and it has to um, have been at least five years since the establishment to be able to look at that. Now, that'll be a little bit relevant when I come to some of the case studies um, in a little bit, um, and then the methods. I'm not going to go into too much detail because I'm going to try and explain uh, using a case study of how we did this, but obviously we collected a whole lot of distribution data written written records. We chose a time frame of 500 years before present, um, up to roughly about 1930, in terms of looking at the distribution points um, that have been recorded and can be verified. We then classified um, this data in terms of its accuracy, in terms of how can we use it, how is it, how is it relevant. Um, we then selected vegetation types um, using the SA VegMap vegetation types as surrogates. So if we had distribution points in a specific vegetation type, we would then select the vegetation type as being possibly the distribution. <clears throat> the reason we use the vegetation types, going through the process of the classification of SA VegMap, it has biomes, bioregions, um, and then VegMaps, and it sort of represents the time scale of where we are. So some of the veg types um, would represent um, something that used to be something, but it would be in a bioregion of a grassland, um, so it represents the time scale of change. So it's appropriate temporally and spatially because the size of the veg maps made it possible for us to be able to assess distribution. Um, then we selected adjoining vegetation, so after we went through the process of selecting these veg types that had distribution data, we considered those veg types that joined them or that had been previously captured in one of the other processes since 1990 for it. And then evaluated those veg types in terms of the ecological criteria, not only um, for the vegetation, but also for the species in terms of its behavior, ecology, and what its requirements are. Um, we then identified hard barriers to natural distribution, like the escarpment. <laughs> and then um, we did cleaning and smoothing. Um, 
in terms of a minimal buffering um, to include some of those benign inlying habitats. Um, and just very quickly, it looks a little bit blurry, but basically the first, first three things that are here is those that are confirmed. So there was a data point um, in a vegetation type that was referenced. You could spatially place it in terms of its accuracy. Then you had inferred. So it was, a, it, it was probably there, but it was within 10 kilometers or 20 kilometers, but it was possible to select that specific vegetation type. Then, as I said, we did the ecologically assessed and adjoining. And all of those have references. I've chosen to put Bontebok here because it has the least amount of veg types in terms of what was selected. Um, some of the species which are widely distributed in South Africa have hundreds, like they're, they're just all over, but they are all appropriately referenced. So these are the short references of where the information comes from that substantiates why that veg type was selected. <coughs> um, we use Bontebok, see if the color is okay. So the legend says that the darkest green is those that are confirmed and referenced. The next dark color is inferred and referenced, and then adjoining and referenced. And if you're looking at the map, basically what you're looking for is where are the areas that are included that have no references, and obviously there are no references out there. Um, and then we went through a process of smoothing those, and it resulted in a map that looks like that for Born to Book. For Cape Mountain Zebra, which is also um, easier to zoom in um, as opposed to some of the others, it looks a little bit different. Again, the darker areas are those for which we have references that say that historical distribution is confirmed or inferred for those. And then the lighter areas that are here are the ones which are included for either, um, I'll get to the criteria in a minute, um, cleaning and smoothing but that they did not pose significant barriers to dispersal. So we assessed the ecological characteristics of those vegetation types in terms of whether they would be able to sustain movement or populations of the species being assessed for a short period of time. If the answer was like a definite no, like the escarpment in Limpopo that would be excluded, um, in this case they were, they were included and the Cape Mountain Zebra map um, looks like this. Um, the cleaning and smoothing, just very briefly. Um, basically, it's an, an algorithm process of coming up with um, a rounded range which doesn't have a definitive barrier that allows for this um, minimal dispersal gradient from where you've set the ranges into, into the next one, um, and also to remove the insignificant gap. So if you think you would have the whole of South Africa and you might chuck out alluvial vegetation types and then you'll have all these alluvial blobs, but they're not really barriers to movement, so it doesn't warrant to say that it's not going to be there. And if the maps are going to be used by for regulation, you don't want to have a gap in the map that says this is not included for no particular reason. So, um, and then also to simulate connectivity where it was necessary um, in terms of the smoothing. So it sort of looked like this. If we go back to the Born to Book map, um, the first process was to look at the insignificant ones. So anything less than 10 square kilometers is really small and it's not going to be a barrier to dispersal. So in the GIS process is just to eliminate those. Then the next one was to look at the exclusions that were larger than 10 square kilometers, and as I said, that's looking at the ecological criteria of those, and then deciding whether it does pose a, a, a barrier to dispersal or not, and if not, then those were included. Um, in terms of the smoothing, we used a very small buffer um, around the edges that sort of looks like this, and then it creates a little bit more of those, and it's like really no, it serves no purpose to exclude those, so they were included, and that's just a closer zoom in terms of um, the process of this is the range, um, it has a buffer, it is smoothed with an algorithm, buffered and smoothed again. Um, <clears throat> so we think that this results in the most comprehensive, improved and detailed assessment to date um, of natural distribution ranges for the species um, that we did. Um, as Andrew said, it's a working hypothesis, so the idea is, is that we start with a baseline and the more credible information we can add the, the, the smoothing model basically runs by itself. You plug the stuff into GIS and it'll spit out a new map if we have new data points. Um, we've assessed 22 species and subspecies. Um, hippopotamus, black, rhino, small antelope, um, and the large predators have not been done yet. And we do acknowledge that there are some limitations um, to the process and to the maps um, as they are, which is basically a result of uh, the data, you know, like where we get the data and the history. So we've, we've gone through a whole lot of books and writes up on, on, on the history. Um, if I go back to the map on Rhone, 
Um, those were the previous maps, and this is the result at the moment. And why I chose Rhone is because there's a significant um, addition to Rhone based on the process in terms of the new information that says in the last 500 years, Rhone were actually distributed in the Eastern Free State, which in none of the previous maps had been acknowledged. And then if I go to some of the challenges, um, we mentioned yesterday in terms of the Cape Mountain Zebra that um, COP has just approved the listing from Appendix 1 to Appendix 2. Um, and why this poses challenges is that the moment that the Appendix listing came through, uh, industry reported that the value of Cape, Cape Mountain Zebra fourfold increased. And we already have applications for the establishment of Cape Mountain Zebra populations that do not meet the IUCN criteria. So it would be out of range, small populations in captive types of scenarios. So that is the playing it in terms of we wanted to achieve an incentive, and now what we have is the incentive is there, but how will this affect our biodiversity targets for Cape Mountain Zebra? At the moment, we've achieved the success in exceeding the previous IUCN target, and there are roughly 5,000 um, animals. And why I bring this up is because in contrast to 90% of the current Cape Mountain Zebra subpopulations meeting the criteria, for Born to Book, the opposite is true. Um, if you can see on the map in terms of the colours, the yellow ones that are indicated here are the only born to book populations or subpopulations in the Western Cape that are 15 animals or more. So if you know anything about conservation genetics, none of those are really viable, the ones that are smaller. If you consider the stats around born to book and the distribution throughout South Africa, this indicates, and you can't really see the numbers, but that's 1,300 in the Northern Cape, 3,500 in the Eastern Cape, 1,700 in the Free State, a total of 2,600 in the Western Cape, of which only roughly 515 animals occur in the natural distribution range. This map that I've inserted here is basically just those points. It just highlights where the yellow ones are for those that are actually meeting the criteria, and it excludes everything outside of range. So the situation for Born to Book is different, and what we also did for Born to Book was apply um, the criteria for the extra or the benign range. So we modeled it, we back modeled it, but actually if we used um, the eco regions that are published by the IUCN, it gives us those two, as, those two additions as being within the same eco region, which is what we have been regulating for the last 20 years in terms of where we would um, support introductions of those. But as I said, the case is, is that all of those little ones that are all over the place are just groups of two or, th two or three. So in conclusion, um, to support the biodiversity economy strategy, obviously these maps have value. Um, I think they pose a whole lot more questions than what they provide answers. Um, but it does give us a handle in terms of going forward with conservation strategies. Um, they can be used in terms of reintroduction guidelines or to support green certification um, or to provide decision support for permits. They are available for use and will be published by Department of Environmental Affairs within the next week or two. Um, the shapefiles will be available for use. And one of our aims um, is so that this information is used and if anyone finds additional information is to make sure that it finds its way back so that we can grow and develop these maps. Um, and that's just the, the metadata. And if anyone wants the information, obviously you can ask for it, we will provide that. Um, and then just very quickly before I end off, I'm just going to run through the ones that are complete. So that's black wildebeest, that is blessbok, blue wildebeest, buffalo, eland, gemsbok, giraffe, impala, kudu, Nyala, Plain Zebra, Red Artebius, Sable, Springbok, Chesabee, Waterbuck, Rhinoceros White, and then acknowledgements obviously. Um, Professor Borsoff and Curley made a lot of their distribution data available to us before they actually published it. Um, and then there's a whole lot of people who participated since 2012. Um, to help us define the purpose of doing this. So thank you very much.